So, yeah, so today we have a, a very interesting topic uh, as Kenyans, and I'm sure it's something that has been has affected us, all of us. And uh, we, 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 we decided to have uh, uh, this uh, webinar. It's, we usually have monthly uh, webinars, and uh, we chose to have uh, this webinar on the cost of the rising cost of living, how to respond. Uh, we've had uh, all of us being affected in this. And uh, we have lined up two great speakers. Uh, one of them is uh, Mrs. Uh, Magdalene Kirago, who is a Kenyan parent. And uh, we would like uh, going forward, we'll be engaging with her just to share with us how she has been uh, adapting to the rising cost of uh, her living as a family, uh, what, she, what measures she has put in place to ensure that uh, the effect or to minimize the effect on our family. And also we'll be having Mr. Gibson Mazanjoke, a senior tax consultant with Addison Tax, uh, who will also give us a professional angle on the issue of uh, uh, the rising cost of living. Why the cost of living? So he will give us uh, all this, what has brought all this uh, to the Kenyan economy. Uh, so to start us off, I'm sure they are, they are in here. Uh, I will invite both of our speakers just uh, to say hi uh, to the members present uh, briefly uh, before I invite uh, officially uh, Mr. Gibson to start us off. So I'd like to invite uh, Mrs. Magdalene Muni to just say hi to the members, uh, maybe briefly about yourself. We would like to know who is Magdalene. Karibu. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. I hope you can hear me. Laura. Yes, 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 we can hear you. Okay, so good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Magdalene Muni. As uh, Mr. Daniel has um, ably introduced me, I'm a Kenyan parent. Um, also trying to circumvent this high cost of living. I'm happy to be here and I'll be sharing with you practical ways of which I, as a parent, have used to try and you know, deal with this issue, but also try and see how we can, how we've been called as Christians to be able to, 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 to deal with this issue. So I'm very happy to be here and uh, thank you for having me, Daniel. Uh, thank you, thank you, Magdai. Uh... I'm hoping I will, you'll be able to share uh, with us more, especially I'm sure there are young people who are here. Uh, some of them are yet to get married. So you'll be covering from those who are married and also to the young people uh, we are yet uh, to get married. So also I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Gibson, Madanjuki, uh, also to briefly introduce yourself kindly. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Gibson, Madanjuki as you stated rightfully so. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, I work as a tax practitioner. So what this means is that I help individuals and organizations to navigate through the tax atmosphere within our country. And then I also help businesses. I, I generally do a lot of business advisory. So professionally, that's what I do. So yeah, and I'm excited to be here. Uh, thank you, Bona Gibson, uh, for that. So uh, I remember during the celebration of uh, Labor Day celebration, we saw the president uh, uh, as, as he was uh, giving his uh, speech, uh, say that uh, there are some things Kenyans are, are accusing him of, uh, especially the issue of the rising cost of living. Uh, he said that uh, he's not in Ukraine. Uh, maybe trying to maybe uh, make us believe that it's the war in Ukraine that has caused the rising cost of uh, living. But uh, as a professional, someone who has been working in this space for long, Bwana Gibson, why the rise of cost of living? What is making things, uh, the price of uh, uh, commodities to rise? The fuel, uh, also, if you come to milk, everything what, uh, has risen up. Why this? The floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think there are, there are several factors which we which we can attribute to the high cost of living. Uh, first of all, I think it's important to acknowledge that 
2020 was a pretty bad year for us as a country. Uh, with COVID-19, a lot of businesses, everything went on a go slow. Uh, 2021, there was also quite a bit of a COVID scare and uh, the recovery really didn't happen as much. And as we've been trying to recover in 2021, come 2022, of course, the Russia-Ukraine was started off. And that is not something that you can know. Uh, however, with or without COVID and, and, and the Russia and Ukraine crisis, uh, the, our cost of living was still rising. And part of this can be, part of this could be attributed to the high cost of, uh, to, to the kind of debt we are having. Uh, estimates from Treasury as at now is that we are doing, our public debt is slightly over, six trillion Kenyan shillings. And that's, that, that's a lot of money. We are talking about, that's over 60 billion USD. That is what we are talking about in terms of debt. Uh, so when you compare the debt that we have as a country, uh, vis-a-vis how much we are collecting, or rather when you compare our debt repayment uh, vis-a-vis what we are collecting as a country, uh, we are still in a crisis. And especially because we are using a huge amount of our budget or rather our revenue collection to service debt. So it's becoming quite difficult. And of course the, the shilling has lost value uh, so that if I'm in business, uh, I assume I was importing a hundred books. I assume I am a bookseller. I was importing a hundred books for a hundred thousand shillings earlier on. Uh, right now, because of the high rise in the dollar, uh, I, I'll possibly be importing 70 books. So that, that increases the cost of doing business. And yeah, I, I think in a nutshell, that sets the flow for the reasons that we can see that are contributing to the high cost of living as a country. Uh, thank you, Bona Gibson. So I was having a talk uh... Uh, with my colleagues uh, based on the, the introduction of the 16% VAT, uh, where they were also saying uh, it has uh, contributed to the rising cost of living. And also we are discussing the how other, the, the, the first world countries, that is UK and US, that they have a higher level of taxation compared to Kenya. Uh, and uh, we were able to see that uh, the tax, the tax, the percentage of tax in Kenya somehow is lower compared to the UK. Uh, I don't know if you compare to Kenya and uh, those who are in the UK, uh, the, 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 the cost of uh, uh, being of prices, the prices in UK and maybe in Kenya, how is it compared? Uh, I'm not sure if that's a fair assessment. Yeah. And for the simple reason, we cannot just compare we, we cannot just compare taxes in the UK and in Kenya and come up with a conclusion as to whether the taxes in Kenya are 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 quite high or not. And for the simple reason, uh, our economies as they are structured, uh, sorry. Hello. I think uh, we, we've lost uh, Bona Gibson. So we'll go back uh, to Magdalene as we wait for, or oh, I can see saying we are new team. So as we wait for Bona Gibson to uh, maybe to be able to speak, uh, Magdalene Muni, how have you been adapting to this cost of living? I'm sure uh, many people here would like to share one-on-one -on -one experience. Uh, this, both the families, those who are married, and now the, the, the bachelors, 
uh, those who are yet to be married. Karibu. Um, thank you, Daniel. Um, I am married with uh, four children, and currently I'm living with five children in the house. So actually, we, I, call, I call our family the loud and proud team because we are the loudest in the area. Now, as you can imagine, a family, um, this cost of living has caused such a stir in, in everybody's life. I mean, whether you are you know, married, whether you're a bachelor, whether you have, you know, you know, a bit of extra income or not, it has cost quite a star. And that's uh, something that we have we are still, you know, grappling with, as Mr. Gibson has said. I mean, the kind of debt we are in and everyone is feeling the pinch and it's coming right down to, you know, the person. So what I can say is that, first of all, it's very easy to feel overwhelmed, you know, as a as, a, as anybody, forget about being a parent or even being, you know, a student or even being someone who is not, you know, um, married. It's very easy to feel overwhelmed. And it's um, the, the thing is, we cannot, you cannot blame, okay, yes, you, it's, it's, there's, a, there's a bit of integrity and leadership that to blame. But at the same time, even though our president, we feel that maybe he's not, uh, he's saying that he's, like, you know, he's not in Ukraine, at the end of the day, some things are out of his hands, some things are in his hands, but that we can't, we have no say in the integrity of, you know, of leadership. You know, that's his, it's, it's him as a guru. He's like, you know, he's the one who's in the country. And the decisions that he makes on behalf of the country and of our livelihood, I mean, they affect us directly or indirectly. And then we also remember that we have, we are coming, you know, coming back from a crippling pandemic. And as Mr. Madanjuki has said, that um, it, it crippled everything. Businesses were lost, you know, people closed businesses, people who ran schools closed schools. Um, there were two other couples that were working in the service industry. And I can imagine what happened to those couples now that they didn't have a source of income. And then also there's this market disruption for the Ukraine crisis. It has caused a rising cost of oil and, you know, all this thing and fuel and all that. So it's very easy to feel overwhelmed. However, as a Christian, you just come, we just come close our eyes, you know, and, and pray that this is going to end. We just can't pray this away. You know, we are Christians yet, we're called to pray, we're called to believe, but this is not something we can just close our eyes and assume that, you know, if we pray really hard, God is going to take care of everything. We also have a part to play. So I want to start by saying that there's no human ideology or even political ideology. That we hold all the answers, you know, to solving the world's problems. Only God can do it. Only Jesus can do it. He tells us that in His word. But still, this is still no excuse. And you have no business. You have something to, to to contribute. You have something to do. You have something to to give. You have something to do. And as God commands us to carry on His work of taking care of the poor, the vulnerable, we are also called to to tackle the points of injustices caused by the, you know, the lack, lack of, you know, blaming of people. We are called to not close our eyes, but to open our eyes and see what we can do. And um, with what this, what the Bible tells us, um, like I, it Acts chapter 14, verse 22, it says, we must go through much tribulation to enter the kingdom of God. So this is part of what we are called to do to enter the kingdom of God. And um, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, it says, the Lord will provide according to his riches in glory. Uh, and this is a very critical message, especially in these times. It is not to be taken lightly by the day. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, it says, the Lord will not give us a process that we can not bear. And then um, lastly, Philippians chapter 2, verse 14 to 15, it says, do all things not complaining. Um, and disputing that you may become blameless and humble and harmless children of God, right? So that is what the Bible tells us. Now, what is our role as Christians? What have I done? What can we do? I remember one of the big things that we can do, and I remember this because of a very sad story that happened in 2020. We should be our brother's keeper. That is a very key message for this. In 2020, uh, I lost a friend who. 
I had no idea I was going through a tough time. She never had food. And because she was the only one who was earning in her family, everybody had come to stay with her in her two-bedroom house. So her mother, her sister's children, her children, um, and her, uh, you know, people from her, from her family had come to stay with her. And nobody knew. We just assumed because she's strong and she's strong-willed, but she's okay. And she was suffering. And she didn't have food. And later on, she told us that she found a 10 shilling coin in her, in her home. And she bought a banana. And she was struggling. She was struggling to hide it from her mom, to hide it from the children, because she felt, this is the only food I have for the whole day. And this is someone who's working. Because all her money is going into rent and to pay for, for other things that, you know, and nobody knew until the day she breathed her last and, and she died. And now later on, when we were sleeping, but, you know, we didn't know. So being a brother's keeper is not just waiting for them to come and tell you, we don't have a problem. It's for us to understand and for us to check the people who live with us or around us, or even our, even our families, are they okay? You know, are they fine? Are they going through problems in, you know, in terms of having food, even, you know, mental health issues, food issues, what is happening with them? So we are called to be our brother's keeper. And then to one thing that works for me in my family is to reduce wastage. Nothing is thrown away in my house. Not a morsel of food, not whatever it is that we have cooked or whatever it is that has been prepared, it is not thrown out, it is kept. Yeah, and this is something that families and even people who are single can adopt. You know, try and see what, what is it in your household that you can stretch? How can you stretch that coin? How can you stretch that food? How can you stretch that food? And these are things that we're called upon to, to think, especially in this crisis, because wastage is one thing that has, you know, has made uh, people, you know, start, you know, people are wasting so much food out there and other people have barely anything to eat. So to answer your question, there's a lot of creative ways that we can use in our homes, in our, in our, you know, societies that we can try and, and minimize, you know, that wastage and can be our brother's keeper. We can also take initiative in the community. So I just think back and say, um, you know, this is for people out there to try, you know, try and go to the people, the children's school. What are they being taught? Are they being taught things that are going to make them better Christians, better savers, better investors? You know, go there and ask, you know, you have a right to do that. You know, go and ask and find out what they're being taught, find out what you can, what you can give. And then in our churches, let's not just be passive Christians, just go to church and praise and then go back home. Find out what programs can, can we get involved in? Is there a donation drive? Can we do, um, you know, donations in terms of cash and in kind? What can we do to reach that person who has barely anything, you know, to eat? So to answer your question, there are lots of things practical that we can do that can make, you know, um, this um, situation livable. Uh, thank you, thank you, Magdalene, for, for that. I'm sure we'll come back to you. I would like you maybe to share briefly uh, where if it's about buying, where do you buy the goods uh, at a cheaper price, all that, so that you can, in quotes, what people say, chanwas, so that also we can be able uh, to go there and, and, and buy that. Uh, I can see Gibson, are you uh, okay now? Yes, I am. Oh, uh, sorry, sorry, apologies for that. Uh, we were just discussing about uh, the root causes of the rising cost of uh, living. Uh, so I would like us, maybe you can share with us the short term and long impact, uh, long term impact on the economy. And also uh, just like uh, Magdalene, Magdalena shared with us how Kenyans uh, can uh, uh, respond effectively to raise the rising cost of living. Mm. Uh, I, I think first, before I respond to the short-term and long-term effects, uh, initially we were talking about, you are asking, you are, you are trying to compare the taxation system in Kenya and in countries like UK. And I think I was alluding to the fact that you cannot just compare the two blindly and for two reasons. Uh, one is the strength of the economies and also, too, is the fact that we may have 
the same taxation system or they may seem to even have a higher one, but when you look at the kind of incomes that people make in such countries, then the comparison is ideally not possible. So that what you realize is, let's say, just an example, uh, a country like the UK, the VAT could be 16%, 18%, the same here with Kenya. However, the average wage in the same country could be about $3,000. And in Kenya, the same could be about uh, $700. So already the, the, the taxpayer in Kenya, whenever he or she goes to the grocery store to shop and to buy, uh, they are already challenged with how much they are able to afford. So we are in a scenario where the wages, wages in our country have not increased per se, but the cost of living has increased. So that we are faced in a scene, we are faced with a scenario where I have been earning 50,000 shillings for the last three years, but everything else has increased. Uh, the, the price of gas has gone up, electricity has gone up, uh, the cost of food has gone up, every single price has gone up. But as a Kenyan, I am left without any reprieve on that. And that is a challenge that we are faced with. Now, the short-term effects and the long-term effects, I think the short-term effects, of course, we, we are feeling it right now is that the price of things will go quite high. So we, we are not able to save more. So common households in this country will not be able to save because or rather the amount of money that you're able to save is minimal compared to what you are able to save earlier on. So that, that's one of the challenges that we are going to face. And of course, the levels of development as a country are going to reduce. Now, the bulk of our budget at any given year for the last several years goes to two things. The first one is debt repayment. The second one is recurrent expenditure. And when we are talking about recurrent expenditure, we are talking about things to do with wages of civil servants and the likes. And the moment much a bulk of our revenue goes to that, that means that even for us as a country, the money that we have, uh, the money that we have to, to invest, let's say in things like free primary education, better health care, roads and all that is minimal. And the only way we are going to be able to invest in such projects is by borrowing more, which is dangerous. Because right now uh, we are in a way, we are having sort of an economic crisis that has, which one of the largest contributors to it is debt in itself. So that if we are not careful, we, we could have a crisis, our, our economy could collapse completely because of debt. And this may seem far-fetched, but I think if you look at what has been happening in countries like Sri Lanka recently, uh, the economy has come to a collapse and simply largely because of debt. So yes, you have beautiful roads, you have beautiful bridges, but you're not able to move. And you're being taxed heavily. Uh, you are, you are, the, the wages that you earn are not increasing, but you have to finance for all these infrastructural projects. Uh, in the long run, still, we, we're going to take quite a couple of years before we recover from the debt crisis we are having. Uh, so I think even if we change the current political regimes, we'll have to make quite a lot of bold steps as a country to ensure that we can get up on, on our knees and simply be able to fight off whatever is going on. Uh, but I think a short term remedy to this, or maybe we can talk about that later, but maybe a short term remedy to this. One of the things is simply the people that we are letting in into office, and especially members of parliament, what is their thinking around 
all these the the debt that we are having and of course I, I know one thing you've complained quite a, quite a lot that KRA taxes us a lot. Uh, I think I am of the opinion that KRA has been doing a fantastic job in terms of tax collection. They should keep up with the same seal any loopholes of tax, tax losses. The problem is not with KRA. The problem that we are having right now is where the money goes after, once it leaves carry, it goes to treasury. So the redistribution of money from treasury to other government entities and agencies, that is where the crisis is. And currently I was checking in yesterday's paper, uh, parastatos alone or medium and small enterprises about 122 billion. And I can tell you from experience following up money with government is tedious. So you do you do work, uh, you deliver on time, but when it comes to payment, the follow-up is the follow-up is another job in itself. Uh, so that at the end of the day, and what happens is that when small businesses do not have money, they are not able to hire sufficient people because the more the more you're constrained on cash flows, that means you'll hire fewer people and you want to hold on your money. So if I, as a business owner, would have wanted to reinvest my money back into the business, when the economy is uncertain or when most of my money has been withheld out there, I will hold back to whatever money that I have. And that, of course, causes quite a slow growth of the economy per se. Uh, thank you, uh, Gibson, for that. Yeah, as you have said, I think one of the key things that is uh, really affecting us as a country is the issue of accountability on the monies collected, uh, money we remit as tax. Where does it go? Uh, and maybe, uh, as you have shared, that we, we need to focus on electing uh, leaders of integrity. People are going to put uh, the welfare of uh, the common Mwanaichi. Uh, uh, in their hearts so that they can take care of our interests once they go into parliament. Uh, as we uh, digest that, I would like to invite uh, Magdalene, Madam Magdalene, uh, maybe to share with us uh, uh, the issue now of spending our money. Where do we live by uh, the goods we use at a cheaper price? Uh, how have you uh, been able to adjust? Maybe I hear there are places you can go, you get goods at a cheaper price compared to going to the supermarkets and all these other shops in our local area. Uh, maybe you can share with us more about that. And I know these are very uh, important areas, so people are really uh, careful, uh, keen on listening, and some of them I can see have pens and paper. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Um... Well, that's a very interesting question because this has uh, usually it is shared in many groups, especially on the social media. But if if you really want to save your coin, shopping in a supermarket is not going to do the trick for you because they usually don't have they sell um, items in retail. So if you want to save your coin, you want to go to a place where they're selling in wholesale. So you're looking at wholesale shops. You're looking at places like Kamukunji. You're looking at places like uh, Manikiti. You're looking at now rolling up your sleeves and going to Mama Boga, but not just Mama Boga, because that person who comes to the Kibanda will have bought in a market. So I'm talking about going back to the market. Go to there are very many markets in this country within Nairobi. Uh, you can go to any of those ones and check and see which ones are, are near you. They have better prices. Get them and also do the cost analysis because you may be going to a market that is far away and you, the cost of transport and you know and the cost of bringing them to your house is just it just the same. So I would think about shopping in places where food is sold in bags. Like I said, uh, even when you bring the things back to the house, it is very important that even as as a family you keep a menu uh, that that you follow so that you know that every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday this is what we eat. So you don't come up with a menu arbitrarily that has can help you to try and you know cap your budget your groceries budget to 
some sort of a minimum. And then you can know that we eat uh, this protein three times a week or three sports this and uh, three times a week. Look for places that especially <coughs> are recommended because you can have places that are active but also don't sell quality food. Or where the food is coming from, the source is questionable. So you need to do a good uh, review and see which places come where recommended. And then what's something else that you can do, and this is um, gives them a start something which is said with the current cost, the current, the current um, situation in the economy, it is impossible to save, especially because your salary is remaining as is and the cost of living is, is, is increasing. So you find that sometimes you, you don't know how to stretch that coin, irrespective of how well you may have planned for it, it is impossible. So some, sometimes you have also to think about cutting costs. So if you're maybe eating a certain amount of, uh, if you may be having a certain amount of food in a in a week, try and see if there's an alternative that is still as nutritious that you can still use to spend to stretch that coin. So you have to be very open-minded. You have to sit as a family and discuss. You have to talk to your children about it because they need to know, you know, the kind of shift that you're having to do in your home to, to stretch that coin, to stretch that meal, and then also to try and, you know, um try and see if you can also teach other people to do the same. So you come together. So I've noticed places where people come together as chamas, and they have this chamas called food chama, where you do as little as 100 shillings, uh, let's say a day, or even maybe a week, and you save for, let's say, maybe two or three weeks, maybe of maybe five of you. And then um, you decide that the amount of money you spend or what you get, you're going to go around giving people instead of money, you buy for them food in bank. The more money you have, the cheaper things become. So you can also adopt that kind of um, you know, approach to try and buy things. Uh, there are places where you can get cereals at a reduced price. Uh, the supermarket is not one of them. You can get them from uh, the, the, the cereal shops or that are in town, others are within the market. You can use that. There are places you can get meat at a cheaper price. You can get it from the kitchen to your places. You can go as a group. You say, we are going to get this amount of kilos of meat, and then you're going to come and divide it. Or we're going to go and get this kind of, uh, you know, cereals, we come and divide them. Or we're going to go to a place like, um, there's a place called, um, I think it's Kamukundi's OTC, where you can get even like diapers in bulk and at a cheaper price. And you can also, negotiate your way with these people because you say at the end of the day, everybody wants to make a living. Even the person who is selling is interested in making a living. So you, you, the places where you can negotiate, don't, don't leave any crack pending. Talk to them, see how much you can get. You know, Another very important thing is to also liaise with people back in the villages because they can send you food. A friend of mine was telling me, he stopped buying um, you know, meal, meal, uh, corn meal, this is ungay ugali, because he gets it uh, milled from home and sells it to him, and at a cost of 300 shillings. So it's easy for us to, to stay within our homes within the city and say, you know, we are struggling, but back home, we could invest back home, send money back home, and they, you know, they bring us the things that are fresh and abundant, and also we also support them. So to answer your question, I don't have all the answers in respect to everything or where we can get everything at your price. But I do have guidelines that I follow. I shop at markets. I go to um, open air markets to get stuff for home, clothes for the children. I don't go to, you know, to baby shops and all that stuff. Once in a while occasionally, yes, but you will get places where you know you get good quality clothing at a cheaper price and they're good. So the idea is to roll up your sleeves and you know, go there where the things are. I will come together as groups and go to where these places have been sold and you know, get them, learn to negotiate. And also one thing that really, really helps this kind is to adopt a spirit of poverty. And I remember there's a, there's a book um, authored by St. Jose Maria, and he says, it's called The Way, and he says, rather than in not having, true poverty consists in being detached, yeah? Involuntarily renouncing one's dominion over things. 
That is why there are poor who are really rich and vice versa. So in understanding the status or the, the point of where we are in the economy, it's one thing is to understand this is where we are, we cannot go back. But also understand that we also have a part to play in our own character. You know, we need to also develop our own character in such a way that we are not always attracted to the plenty. You know, that we can, only, we can do we can do a lot with the little that we have. I always tell my children, um, whenever you plan for something, it multiplies. You plan your time, it multiplies. You plan your food, it multiplies. So if you want to, so making a menu ensures that today you're not buying meat, tomorrow you feel like eating sausages, you buy sausage. Tomorrow you feel like eating something, you eat something. There's a plan for everything. Or you want to do 10 things today, but you're so haphazard. You, know, you want to try and do everything at the same time. But if you make a plan of everything, things become different. One day can become two. What you could accomplish in two days, you could do in one, only in terms of planning. So to answer your question, there are things that we must, uh, first we must focus on our own character. We change how we look at the spirit of poverty, we embrace it. And then now you go into the trenches, you look at the places and the prices of things and commodities outside the retail bracket and get into the wholesale bracket, get in there. And in so doing, you're not only getting to save your coin, but you're also uplifting that person who is on the other end. And that way money flows um, on that realm. Thank you. Wow, uh, thank you very much uh, for that, Magdalene. I'm sure at least uh, people have been able to know. I never knew uh, the issue of Marikiti, OTC, yeah. So I think it's somewhere that going forward, uh, I look forward into visiting that uh, OTC area and get to uh, buy a few things as I get to know the streets of Nairobi well. Yeah, so I'm sure the other people would like to share more about this. Uh, when I will open the floor, uh, I will expect uh, some of the people to share how they have been able to adapt other markets where they, have, uh, they are going to buy things at a cheaper price. Uh, Bona Gibson, are you there? Bona Gibson. Yeah, it seems maybe as we will wait for him to get back. Yeah, so uh, there is also the issue of uh, people having to forfeit some of the things that they were used to, to, to take, maybe bread, and that's if they were used to take uh, milk, now you go for the strong tea, commonly known as, uh, is it Tunduvia or Turungi? Turungi. Yeah. <laughs> uh, from your side, uh, what are the things that you think maybe uh, as a family we could forfeit going forward so that uh, as we try to adjust to the rising cost of uh, living? Um, like I said earlier, I don't have the answers to everything, but if you're asking specifically about my family, we have adopted several strategies. Uh, we have, like I said, I have five children under my roof, so it's a bit tricky to try and cap things because children, as you have known, tend to eat a lot. <laughs> so you find that you have to um, have lots of you know, food nearby. But one thing that I have realized that works really, really well is having the proper type of food in the house, as opposed to having bread and, you know, scones and pandazas and all that, which are not bad for children at the end of the day. What I've found out works really well is having fruits nearby. Bananas are very really cheap and children love bananas because my children thankfully like bananas. Having fruits nearby because they give uh, the same, they give the energy, you know, they have energy, they're nutritious, they fill the stomach. So have a fruit every day. So when I, 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 when, I in my, when I replaced you know bread with like bananas and fruits, I realized that um, I made a huge saving. But also the kids started appreciating you know the kind of bananas that we have. So it's a learning curve. So we say 
there's bananas are from the farm, these bananas are maybe the sweet bananas, so they're like this. This is how we peel a banana, this is how we put the, put the peel. We don't just open a banana and throw the peel on the chair. You know? So fruits have become, became in the household, at least a, a replacement for the, the high energy food, like high calorie food like bread. And then also we, like I said before, having a replacement for many things in the house. They started to understand, I didn't even know my children have uh, arrows so much. When I started buying arrows, which we used to have before, but now we made them into the, put them into the menu. And they realized that this one's like arrows, this one likes cassava, this one likes sweet potatoes. And it became, you know, we started making a, a saving based on not buying bread every day. Because when bread itself has gone up, uh, one loaf is, I think, 60, 60 shillings for where it's where it's 60 shillings, no? And you can imagine one loaf of bread in my household is serves only three children. <laughs> and you have to you have to carry it for breakfast, they have their bread for break, and so I wasn't going to be, you know, uh, sustainable. So we introduced the culture of fruits and the culture of traditional vegetables. We introduced the culture of having a meal at breakfast, you know. Uh, um, my husband and I had gone to Vihiga the other day in Luya land. The lawyers in the house can attest that you wake up to a plate of food, you know, and it is a beautiful culture. You have your stomach for the rest of the day. It's nutritious. It's nothing. It's not, there are not many sugars piled on top. So those are just some of the things that I do personally, and I think people can adopt. There are many other strategies that you can use. I don't believe in starvation. So if you need to get the meal, get it. But maybe reduce the amount per cup or perhaps maybe stretch two packets to go for two days in the house, two packets go for two days as opposed to three, you know, having set times for when to prepare anything. So, and one thing I learned that YouTube is an amazing tool because they teach you to do everything. They teach you to make soap out of little pieces of soap. They teach you to make yogurt from the comfort of your home. So as opposed to buying, you know, things that you can buy in the supermarket, the things that you can even do with the children, you can do it yourself, you can try it out, you can see that you can actually, you can actually do something and, you know, contribute to circumventing this crisis. So there are many, many, many things you can do. I mean, creatively, hundreds. And children really know as much as you tell them and tell them this is what you're doing, they jump on board really fast. And for anybody wishing to, you know, to go through this kind of, um, and to circumvent this problem, I mean, there are things out there, articles, you know, things on the on 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 YouTube you can use. There are so many things that one can do to try and you know get over this thing. So I sometimes see them. There are ways in which we can actually creatively come up with the resolve this thing within our families. Wow, oh, hey, thank, thank you very much, uh, Magdalene, for that. At least uh, those are very quite insightful uh, comments from you. And I'm sure people are really learning on, on this, especially people in Nairobi. I can see uh, Bona Gibson uh, is back. So Bona Gibson, there is a question here uh, people have asked about why is it that in every electioneering period we witness uh, uh, inflation. We witness rise in the cost of, uh, of, 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 of the cost of uh, living, and uh, also uh, some are saying that maybe the money that is being pumped into the the, the, the market by the politicians is it related in a way? Does the election and uh, the rising cost of uh, or the inflation rather are they related in any way? Uh... I, I, I don't think the relationship really in this particular scenario is significant. And I think relating, the, there may be a slight change because of the nervousness that comes with the elections and all that, but I don't think we can blame our problems on the upcoming elections. Uh, our problems have been building up for the last several years. And I think we are just almost getting to the apex of it. Uh, so I wouldn't really place my blame on the on 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 the upcoming elections. 
However, uh, I would say that the current parliament has had quite a big role to do with what we are having right now. And their, their failure to be tough on the executive is one of the reasons that we are where we are right now. Uh, but without feeling like we are passing blame and uh, trying to allude to what Magdalene was saying on just how to cope with this whole thing. Uh, I think my, my opinion from where I see it is that times will be hard. Uh, they will be harder for the coming for the coming days. A change in regime does not mean that our cost of living will be back to normal. However, a change in regime could mean that there is a relief to Kenyans. Uh, there could be ways to, 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 to draft and redraft, especially our taxation laws, so that Kenyans can have some ease, but it will not make things easy. Uh, so that especially if, if you're running a business, it will be important to have a prudent saving culture. If you're running a household and you're employed, it is important to, to you know, all the things that Magdalene was alluding to. So we, we may know the, the, the road ahead is not yet, we are not yet out of the woods. Uh, we have quite some way to go. Uh, but I think we will be out of it quite soon. Now, having said that, in a way, it seems that we are helpless. And this is it and we are done. No, we are not completely helpless. And, and I think, and that's why for me, the people that we elect in August become quite, quite instrumental in terms of, because we can even renegotiate on the loans that we are paying for, it's possible to renegotiate on the terms. Uh, because for example, if, if you're paying in hundreds of billions per year, it is possible to renegotiate on how much you can pay for. It is also possible to renegotiate for cancellation of these things. And ignoring the local loans that have been taken from our local banks, it is not new for developing countries to go to the developed nations and you tell them, here we are. We know our people borrowed loans, we did this and this. But can we, can we renegotiate on the payment terms or could we even come up with modalities on how to do away with this whole thing? So there are things that are there on the table. Uh, there are options that we have that we, we can work with, because because at the end of the day, if this debt issue is not resolved, we shall be in a much worse crisis than it is right now. Now, on taxation, uh, maybe what or the conversation we are having earlier on, our tax, some of the taxes could be reduced. Uh, for example, and. I think the papers were reporting this week how the amount of excess duty that has been collected from airtime has decreased quite drastically. The, the total revenue collected has decreased for the simple reason, the higher you tax people does not mean greater consumption. Simply what it does, and, and I think we all saw that because I think from last year, when you put a hundred of credits, I'm not sure if my numbers are correct, but like 30 bob goes to taxes. So what this has done is that people have realized I only need to buy bundles and possibly I can call people on WhatsApp. Alternatively, I can text people more since it's cheaper. You can subscribe to and such things. So that some of the taxation laws, some of the taxes that we have, actually we could lobby, and that could be part of what we should be doing, lobbying government to reduce some of these taxes. Because what it does, um, when a product is cheaper, people tend to consume more because you have more disposable income. So if I buy, let's say, airtime for 100 shillings, and out of the 100, I actually get value for my money. Tax is only 10 shillings and not 30 shillings. I'll call more people and government will collect more revenue. 
But the moment I feel that a product is expensive, I will shy away from that product. So if I feel a product is expensive, I shy, I shy away from it and I go to the product that is cheaper. So some of the tax laws that we passed out of desperation in the last, especially last year, are biting back at us. So we are losing revenue instead of gaining. So I think now part of it and, and, and the challenge that we have is looking at the tax laws, looking at each of these taxes that we have. Have they contributed to more revenue being collected or lesser revenue being collected? So that now from there, we're able, you, you're able to sit with MPs and tell them, look, you guys, you introduced this and this, these are the numbers. Before the introduction, this was the tax that was there and these are the numbers. So yes, there are, there are ways and that we still can use and follow so that we are able to, to collect more revenue and also reduce the burden that we have on the burden that we have on, on the cost of living. Also, uh, an unpopular opinion, especially in my circles, would be we have quite a huge number of multinational companies operating in this country with serious tax incentives. Uh, so that let's say I as Gibson, I, 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 run a, I run a factory in an in industrial area and I make clothes and a similar factory is running uh, within EPZ and they do the same business as I do. Only that for them, their business purely is for export. And you find such businesses, those within the EPZ and SEZ regions getting quite a lot of tax incentives. Uh, my opinion is that we need to really look at the kind of tax incentives we're giving, especially to foreign companies, and really sit and ask ourselves, what value are they adding? Is it as beneficial? Are the numbers adding up? Uh, and, and this will start from the taxes that are being paid, uh, the amount of salaries that employees are being paid, ultimately is a tax incentive on such entities uh, beneficial to the country. So I think my, my thinking is, if you look at how we are structured, it's possible for us to collect more revenues within our current tax structures without burdening Wanjiku any further. So that it's time we sit and just look at a lot of things that incentives that we've given to foreign companies including things that we call double tax agreements. Double tax agreements is where I am, a, I am an investor from the UK, I come and invest in Kenya. So what a double tax agreement does is that it allows the, the UK investor who comes into Kenya to pay tax at a lower rate compared to an ordinary Kenyan company. So these are some of the things that we really need to look at and see are we making losses? Is, is the incentive really bringing business as we thought it should? If, if we did away with, with these incentives, what will be the effect on our economy? Now, secondly, uh, in terms of even just trying to resolve the crisis that we are in, I think we have a problem with corruption in our country and we cannot uh, overemphasize on that. And we need and we ought to be careful with where is the money going to? When we talk of money being spent on the current expenditure, other than wages, uh, do, we, do we have more people than we need working in government offices? Uh, are we spending money on things that we do not need to spend? And a few years ago, rather, uh, I remember there's a time government was quite keen on the kind of motor vehicles that senior government officials were using. That was very short lived. And then after that, they went back to their fuel gas last. Is that something worth to look into? So, so that I believe in terms of expenditure and especially as government, and if we follow, when, when you look at some of the audit queries that are raised by the Auditor General, uh, on various parastatos and ministries, uh, what you realize is that there are very many loopholes that we can actually see. Uh, when you look at the counties, 
Uh, MCAs have been going for endless trips in different places. The amounts of per DM that are being picked up are enormous. So yes, there are, there, are, there are things that we can do. And I think those are some of the conversations that we ought to be having right now to cure the problem that is there currently. Uh, thank you, thank you, Gibson, for that. Uh, I would like to open the floor uh, for anyone who might be having a question uh, to ask. Uh, and as we wait for that, I don't know if uh, yeah, patients, I can see patients uh, is here with us. Uh, she's also a parent. And I would like her uh, uh, maybe also to, if she can uh, give us some insights, Kidogo, about how she has been coping, especially on the buying buying of goods, I know also uh, she might have one or two ideas that you can share with us, with us for two minutes, kindly, if uh, she can hear us. Meanwhile, as we wait for uh, Bona Gibson, I can see a question here uh, about the issue of uh, taxing uh, uh, the, those who have uh, retired, what do we call it? Uh, you know, some of us have forgot uh, parents who have retired, they are former civil servants. And uh, there was something that was proposed, I think, sometimes back to tax the, 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 the pension that they are given. Does that really make sense for someone having worked for all those years that again, the pension that uh, you have been uh, contributed to the government again is being taxed and how does it happen uh, in the other countries? Uh, I can see Bona Lucas has a question. Uh, Karibu, uh, Reverend Lucas, uh, you can ask uh, your question. Are you able to unmute? Yeah, okay, Karibu. Thank you, thank you. The host uh, was just yet to allow me to unmute, but thank you. Um, thanks a lot to the panelists. Thanks, um, Gibson and Magdalene for sharing with us your insight and um, your experience. Um, Two, two questions, uh, largely for Gibson. One of them is um, the practical realities of um, sorting out the mess we are in. And you, did, you did at some point ask, are we helpless? Uh, and you said, no, we, we are not. Um, there are things that can be done. Um, but the things that can be done are done at a governance level, almost at a national leadership level, if, if I heard you right. Those of us on this call may not be able to do much on those, apart from the few votes, uh, there are about 12 votes uh, on this, at least for those who are on the Zoom. I don't know how many are watching on Facebook. So that, um, I mean, we can think about that. My question then is, um, do you have any projections uh, from your professional circles? Before Gibson began writing difficult things about tax and economy, uh, I knew him more as a prophet. So maybe this is inclined to those, but <laughs> what pro pro any projection as, as you look at our country? Because my, my concern is, I, I don't see our governance issues changing significantly. And so are there any projections and some advice that you can give us, those of us way? My second question has to do with the foreign currency. There are concerns about the dollar, not only the rising, um, I mean, the, the whatever, in terms of its gains against the Kenya shilling, um, but also now even on its availability. Uh, for those of us who are here, there may be one or two of us who have some interests on, on those. Are there, is there anything that we need to look out for? For example, if I have any dealings 
um, in, 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 in dollars. Is it time to put my house in order or, or do you think that this situation is going to normalize, especially taking into consideration the local factors and the global ones as well? Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Lucas, for the questions. Uh, maybe I'll start with the whole question of taxing retirement benefits. Uh, I think first it's important to note that that has always been present. So it's not something new. Uh, we've been taxing pensions, uh, but uh, there is a huge relief on how pensions are taxed. So the entire amount of the pension is not taxed. Uh, but the first about 600,000 of the pension that you receive, you receive it to be tax free. So pension taxation has been there. So maybe the question should be, should we really be doing this? Uh, but I think the argument has been, in most cases, uh, now let's first ignore NSSF and let's assume you're, especially if you're working for government or private sector, uh, some of these organizations have a pension that you contribute to a, a particular pension scheme. And what happens if you notice is that in your pay slip at the end of the month, uh, pensions are, you get a relief on the pension. So whatever amount you're contributing to a pension scheme, uh, your employer deducts, gives you, does not tax you for up to 20,000 shillings that you contribute to a pension scheme every single month. So I think the argument by government is, we encouraged you to save money to a pension scheme uh, when you are young and full of energy. Now that you're retiring, just give us a small share and then enjoy the rest. Because even in your, in your days when you have retired, you still need government services. So maybe the question that we should be asking and maybe for a later forum, is it really necessary to be taxing pensions? Uh, what Lucas is asking, are we helpless? I don't think we're helpless. Uh, although when we look at what is ha happening in the political arena, uh, my opinion is whatever side wins, we, if we leave the governance issue to politicians alone, we will still be in a mess. And my thinking is, and when I look at we as a people and people like Lucas with a pulpit, I think we have the power to push for what we want. And, and probably what we need to do as a society right now, and we need to do it desperately and urgently, is teach our people to speak up. Because when you look at how as a nation we are, uh, they say that we are resilient. And I'm not sure if our economy and us as a people, we are resilient or, we, or it's more of cowardice and trying to mind your own business. As long as I can sort my bills, and I think it's time we taught and our people need to be taught to speak and speak boldly about what we want. Because we cannot be in such a huge crisis, yet we are not talking about expenditure of government, we're not talking about corruption, we're not talking about corruption both in government and, and the public sector. So it's extremely important for us, and, and maybe now the challenge to anyone with a platform, whatever it is, the challenge is, how do we teach our people to be bold? How do we teach our people to mind what government is doing? How do we teach our people to speak up? Uh, because I don't think being silent when this country is going down makes us to be, and, and to be better citizens, to be better believers. No, it does not. We need to speak up because if we learn to speak up and to be confident when we speak, then maybe then our politicians will start fearing the voice of the people. Because when you look at how our politics is 
being played right now uh, as believers or rather the voice of the people really does not matter that much. What people and what politicians fear more is a voice of the party leader. So I think for me, a practical thing that we can actually do, and especially in terms of governance, one, be very careful with the people that we're electing so that if we're able to do vet the people that we're electing and speak out on what we think is the right political, I think we can try to discuss politics beyond our lenses that could be biased or not biased. And then also speaking up and because if we don't then, What's the way forward? Yes, and other than governance, we are not completely helpless. Uh, I think part of what I think will arise from this is a lot of a lot of small businesses. Now, do be, small businesses have a place in our economy at all? I think they. I think the shift will move towards going to huge multinationals and huge and trying to grow small economies. Because when I look at, especially from 2020, when you look at the trend is that in your circles, I'm sure you probably have a friend or two who started off a business and especially at the point of COVID simply because you've been laid off, uh, you need to pay your bills. Uh, there's no Red Cross coming to your help. So you just need to figure things out. And part of the figuring things out is that it has cost quite a lot of people to explore their creative side, look at what they can do other than just seeking for formal employment and even just trying to think of how can I run business in a different way apart from apart from the traditional way. So I think there will be um, there'll be more small businesses sprouting, and I think it will be a challenge for us to support such small businesses. In my opinion, such small, a lot of small businesses have a greater impact in the economy than huge multinationals. And simply because uh, I'm here as a tax consultant, and the truth is that big businesses invest heavily in ensuring that they pay as many more taxes as possible. Small businesses not so much. The focus then for you is how to grow your business. And I think that's more beneficial. So that would be my opinion on that. Yes, uh, on foreign currency, I think like one of the things I've noticed is that when you go to change the dollar right now, they're quite keen on you having an ID. Uh, and especially, and if you're changing over $10,000, they will actually want to know the source of where, where did this money come from and all that? Uh, the situation will normalize, in my opinion. Uh, it may not be as soon as we may want it, but I think it will normalize. We may not go to the extremes that our neighbor Tanzania went to, uh, to the point that foreign exchange shops were shut down and it became almost impossible to get a dollar or what we see in Ethiopia right now where at times, Ethiopians have to fly to Nairobi just to change the dollar. Of course, that's quite a lot of dollars, but there needs to be, right now what we are seeing with CBK is a control on how the dollar is being used and all that. Now, if I'm doing business via the USD, I don't think there's any need to be troubled per se. Uh, I think so far, in terms of mitigation, uh, the CBK has tried quite, uh, so my opinion would be that eventually the shielding will catch up, but that is possibly after the elections, not right now, not in the next two or three months. Uh, back to you, Daniel. I think we are we are having uh, network issues on our side. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Daniel. 
Yes, continue. What's the problem? Uh, maybe before, as Daniel comes back, uh, I would love to highlight a few good things that are happening in our economy so that we can see we are not completely helpless. Uh, recently, Microsoft launched quite a big uh, talent development center in Nairobi, and, and Google is doing the same, and other technology companies are doing the same. Uh, when you look at the, 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 the Kenyan outlook, and especially in terms of technology companies, uh, there's quite a lot of confidence that is there with the Kenyan market out there. And so, for me, my thinking then would be when you see some of these, what I will call big boys in the industry coming and knocking at your door. And by the time they're setting up, of course, they run their numbers, they had their data scientists crunch the numbers, look, looking at whether this is a viable project. I think that spells quite a lot of hope. Uh, there is hope in industry, there is hope in, in our former sector, there is hope also in our informal sector. I think what we need to do is look at how, how as a country are we able to tap into all these big boys to ensure that even as they come, the coming here is not just a mere PR stunt, but we actually benefit and get the most out of them. Uh, because if, if we are able to have a technology hub in Nairobi, uh, and when you look at the, the kind of investments that are being spoken about from Microsoft, Google, and the likes is in millions of millions of dollars. And so me, I think that for me, that shows the kind of confidence that is there in our country and the kind of confidence that is there in our economy. Uh, thank you, uh, Gibson. Uh, I'm sorry uh, we were experiencing some uh, network failure on our side, but I'm back. So uh, there is a question here I see for Magdalene, uh, uh, being a mother of five children. So someone is asking, I hear that uh, the CBC is quite expensive. How have you adapted bearing uh, the rising cost of living and also now the rising cost of uh, education in the country? And how can the young people who are here to take their children adapt to this? Uh, that's a good question. Thank you for asking. Um, the CBC is, this is a good curriculum. Let's start from there. Because I'm talking as from experience as a mother and also as a teacher who has embraced this curriculum. I think one of the benefits of CBC is largely it focuses on the competence of the child. So ideally, it should look at, at the competence of the child in some aspect that if your child is um, good in arts, that's what they'll be focusing on. If the child is good in STEM subjects, that's um, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, that's what they'll be focusing on. There is um, some sort of disconnect in many areas in terms of how this has been implemented, and that is what is causing primarily a pain for parents. Now, in any system, in any sort of implementation, if you want to implement something, you have to have ideally all stakeholders accepting and internalizing whatever it is that you're implementing. When it comes to otherwise, it won't work. If you have people who are against it, who are for it, who are pushing, who have special agendas, it will always be mixed. Now, having said that, even in anything that has been accepted by everybody, there has to be some sort of a teething problem. Now, without going too much into the problems of equity and equality in education in our country, whereby certain counties are marginalized and other counties have a lot, I don't go into that because that's a big discussion. But however, if you, for me as a parent, I have embraced this, but primarily because the school which I have taken my children, the teachers have embraced it. So, and you, the parents need to understand that it is not just the, the prerogative of the teacher 
It is the prerogative of the school administration. It is the prerogative of the parent. Now, CPC has been structured in such a way that um, it is not just the, 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 the teacher and the student who are, you know, into this. This has to be parental involvement or guardian involvement. Whoever it is that takes care of the child has to get involved. It is not an issue of just taking your children to school, but leaving them there and hoping the school will mold them, hoping that they'll get content. Because CBC focuses on the student. It is a learner-centered approach to teaching and learning. Now, um, if I've seen most many people saying that they've been asked to download things and go to the internet, others don't have Wi-Fi, they've been asked to buy expensive things. I was talking with my with my sister the other day, and one of the things that my my, my daughter was asked to bring was um, these speaker phones are called Two Bits by Dr. Dre. And I, I thought about it and I was like, you know, those things are not cheap. You know, this are expensive. So I mean, I had to go back to the school and ask, you know, is this really necessary? Can other headphones also do a similar job? Or is it something maybe with the, something you want them to learn about Dr. Dre that other people really haven't learned? I don't know. So I, I understand where parents are coming from. As a parent, I felt it. But at the same time, we need to speak up. That's the thing. We need to get involved. You need to go and tell the parent or the student or even the teacher, why is it that I've been asked to go to the cyber cafe and download these things? Can't I, can't I cut them up from the magazine or something? Can't I do that? What, because at the end of the day, the end result is to teach the child, you know, a concept. And that concept can be taught in a myriad of ways. You know, it's not just the technology, you know, of course, posting technology on this. So, it's, it's human to complain. I complain a lot, all right? I feel the pain the parents are feeling, but if I feel the pain sitting in my chair and complaining, that doesn't solve anything. You see, walk up to the classroom, go to the teacher, go to the administration. It's your right, you're within the school fees anyway. So go and find out, ask them, what can be done? What other, what other ways can we use to, you know, to get this concept across? Because the moment you sit back and let the teacher do the thinking for you, then you're failing as a parent or as a guardian. So find out things that you can do to, 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 you know, to tackle this issue. And sometimes I feel, uh, if you look at the document and read it, it is a really good document, one that proposes this kind of thing. So get informed, first and foremost, read, right? Read, see what it is that you can do to also, you know, complement or to supplement what the teacher is doing. There's a lot of, um, you know, things that the child is asked to do by themselves, you know, and I see parents rushing in to do these things for them. One time, I, I want my kid was asked to make a building of um, using cardboard, and my child did um, whatever he did with masking tape, it was nice and wobbly, and other kids did the same, but there were kids that were doing, you know, architectural, you know, things, like I'm sure the parent was like, oh, they took it to an architect, or they asked to do something to do with yarn, and they take it to a tailor, or if something you to do, you take you ask to do, you know, something, and take it to a professional, let your child make the mistake. You know, that's how they learn. And so I feel one thing to answer that question is get involved as a parent, read the document, go to school and ask, are there alternative ways for this concept to be taught? Can I, I don't know, speak things through a magazine as opposed to, you know, can I make an instrument with whatever I can find in my house? You know, can I, you know, can I use something else as opposed to this? Because at the end of the day, the concept is what you want to teach. It is not, it's not the, it's the, con it's the concept that you want the child to learn. It is not the way, you know, the way that you teach it is different. I, people walk, others take a bicycle, others drive, others take a plane, others use a chopper. The end is to get there. So quit the complaining as parents, as guardians, get involved with the parents, find time. I think these are, a sharp wake up call to parents who are used to, you know, dividing their roles. So the teacher teaches, I provide, you parent, I do this, but your child needs the whole of you, you know, the imperfect you, but present. So I think that's something I can recommend the parents to. Thank you. Thank you, thank you that for for Magdalene for uh, quite insightful and advice, good advice for 
parents. Uh, I think the issue of engaging teachers going there, trying to seek alternatives, uh, that's uh, something good. Uh, and uh, I can see someone also on the chat room has uh, appreciated what you have shared. Yeah. And uh, as we uh, close our discussion, uh, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Gibson a question. We are professionals and uh, people in rural areas or, or the mamambogas, the boda boda guys, they are look upon, upon us to see how we can help them. As professionals, what can we do? What can we do to help this country? Uh, going forward. Uh, at KCPF, we have been uh, really pushing, bringing professionals together, trying to see how fast we can uh, 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 work together in uh, pushing for full implementation of the constitution, where we believe that if the constitution is fully implemented, it will help in a way. So for you, what advice or as professionals, what can we do if we come together uh, in tackling the issue of rising cost of living? Hmm. Well, uh, I guess that sums it up. <laughs> but my thinking, I, I, I think for me as a professional, my rule is now from a tax perspective, looking at what are the gaps that we have, what are the opportunities that we have, and pushing for the same. Uh, because I believe that some of the things that even organizations like KC, uh, the KCPF is able to do is lobbying. Uh, so being part of such engagements, uh, because at times help is not necessarily going to someone and giving them one, two, three, but I think even lobbying, uh, you probably have, uh, you're able to access platforms where not many people are able to access. So part of it could be lobbying, part of it could be having conversations on just the way forward with people in industry and people in government, actually who, who we call the decision makers and just looking at the disconnect, what's the disconnect between those who are making decisions and those whom the decisions actually affect. So looking for ways to see that. And part of it is having public engagements, lobbying with government, uh, lobbying with different sectors, whether it's county governments, yeah. That's my thinking. Uh, thank you, thank you. I, I think this is something that uh, we, we intend to carry this forward, uh, see how we can bring professionals together. If it's ISPAC, ICS, all lawyers, all those members, bring them together and provide a discourse how we can engage the government because i believe if we come together as uh, professionals then we'll have uh, more bargaining power we'll have uh, a louder voice uh, trying to tackle some of uh, these things yeah so uh, magdalene i have a question here uh, this is a young man uh, currently if you have been watching the news uh, because of what is happening in terms of economy young people are shying away from getting, getting married because of the high cost of living. Has someone who has been there, uh, what advice do you have for the young people who are running away from marriage or others are still thinking, should they uh, get into marriage or stay away from it? Uh, what advice do you have for them? Um, well, that's an interesting question. Um, I think quite the opposite. Um, I don't know, maybe Gibson can tell us, but in my opinion, when you get married, you have combined salaries, which makes it, uh, which makes it easy for people to, you know, to, to go through life easily. Um, I think that the high cost of living is everywhere. It is biting everybody, whether you are married, unmarried, and deciding not to get married because you don't have the high cost of living. I think it's a very subjective, subject, subjective thing to say, because I mean, two heads are better than one, two salaries are better than one. <laughs> so there is a bit of an area there. It's, um, I would say it's an unfounded fear but having said that, 
I think that um, marriage is something that people need to get into beforehand and discuss keenly and critically with your significant other so that you can find out what are the places that which you're going to use the money together. How are you going to use the money? How are you going to spend the money? How are you going to save? What are you going to invest to? What are you going to do when, in terms of children come? Because I believe in the philosophy of being open to life. So when the kids do come, what do we do? So as opposed to shying away from something that you may potentially actually build you, I think it's important to discuss this with your spouses or your partners or your girlfriends and your girlfriends. So ch change the topic of you know, conversation and come to court and as opposed to, you know, I love your eyes, how beautiful you are. Think about, you know, critical things. How will we dis resolve this in marriage? How are we going to do this? How are we going to stretch that coin? How are you going to manage our finances? How many accounts are we going to have? What will be our investment? How will we invest? Who, how should we invest in the first place? Who should we support? Who should we not support? What kind of schools should our, should we take our children? Those are things that you can actually, you know, do or discuss with a significant other. And they can help you actually, you know, um, navigate this life. Because, um, like I said before, two heads are better than one. And um, I think Gibson can also attest to some sort of relief that comes to, you know, marriage, married people. But shying away from a situation is not the, it's not the answer. I mean, you could, you will suffer if, whether, whether you're single, for your money, you still you still have the you know the effects of the rising cost of inflation. The people who are alone and by the way are unable to navigate this uh, territory, and sadly we're seeing them you know taking their own lives. You know, so marriage does not only give you some sort of you know you can go back and tell your husband or your spouse look this happened to me and I want you to give me an you know what should we do about this. You know, it also gives you uh, an avenue where you can actually, you know, talk about your, your issues to the person who will understand them better. But um, saying that, you know, I will get married because it's a high cost of living, um, for me, it doesn't hold any water. I mean, it is going to be high whether or not you're married or not. So it just depends on how you navigate and where you navigate. I hope that's clear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That uh, that is uh, very clear. Uh, understand that there are so many people who are running away from this, uh, and that is the kind of excuse that they are giving uh, out there. You find someone is thirty, forty, they're saying that the cost of living uh, is the key thing that is preventing them from getting married. Uh, but uh, that that is good advice to those ones who are listening. I see we are at. Uh, 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 6.46 so it's a good time for us to end uh, this important debate that we have today uh, I will invite uh, you, the speakers, maybe to share your uh, last uh, what you like to share as we close the, the webinar for today and uh, yeah, I can see there are no more questions from my side or those who have been sending questions so I will start with uh, you uh, Magdalene uh, your last sentiments about this issue of uh, the rising cost of living. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, like I said before, in summary, I think it's to understand that um, a, not to get overwhelmed because it's affecting everybody. We are not alone in this. And people are going through it uh, in different ways. To also learn that there are many, many practical ways that one Issue. All you need to do is just talk about them. Find someone who can do. Is it our side? I think uh, Margaret uh, Magdalene, yeah, she might be experiencing some network challenges uh, from our side. 
as we wait for Bona Gibson. Maybe you can give us your closing remarks as we uh, end uh, today's session. Uh, I, I, I think for me at the end of the day is the situation may look helpless, but I think eventually there is quite a lot to be done to make this country a better place. And I think it's high time that we, especially as believers, actually speak up and hopefully and use all avenues, whether in our churches, all the gatherings that we have just to, 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 to sort of address the issues that we have in this country. But yes, uh, better times are ahead. We just need to fasten our safety belt, a bit of turbulence, but it will get better after the turbulence. Uh, thank you, Gibson. As they say, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. I believe uh, uh, light will come and uh, we'll get out of this mess that we are in. Uh, one of the key things that you have noted is us selecting credible leaders, leaders who care about us, leaders who are going to stand firm against corruption and promote good governance. Because I believe the issue, whatever you're facing through, whatever you're going through right now is about uh, uh, governance. It's a problem associated with governance where we've been borrowing loans and uh, with minimal accountability. So if, you're, if we really think about our future, then a time for us to really think and consider the kind of people, the kind of leaders that you're going to elect uh, come August, August 9th. And that choice will affect us for the next five years. So it's upon us to make the right decision uh, with the guidance of uh, the Holy Spirit. I believe we are going to make the right decision. And with good leadership, I believe they will put the priority of getting us out of this mess first as they uh, take over the governance of this country. I don't know if Magdalene, uh, Magdalene, uh, you are saying something, sorry, we, 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 we lost you at some point. It's okay, thank you. I was just summarizing what I said, and I think Ms. Mazatoki has said that pretty well, that uh, we need just to turn our bells a little bit and face this perilous uh, times. It won't last long, but also to try and you know, think practically of uh, ways that we can, things that we can do or ways that we can use to try and you know, approach this issue. There are many things out there. Um, I'm available if someone wants to talk to me, but also to, to, to put yourself up there and look for, you know, practical ways to deal with the situation. Uh, thank you, thank you very much uh, for our speakers for the day and all those who have uh, joined us. Uh, we've been having network challenges. Uh, I don't know what's the problem. Uh, I'm sure there are those uh, who will, because uh, we have been live streaming and also we share the recording with our members. They will be able to watch and uh, get what we discussed uh, this. In case anyone might be interested in getting uh, or your contacts, I don't know if you are free to share with them. Uh, you let us know, because uh, I'm sure every time we have such a discussion, there are people who uh, get interest of getting to interact with the speakers more. So uh, we'll be calling you or getting in touch to you just to get, have your permission. Uh, at this time, uh, I would like to thank you and I thank you very much for the discussion that we've had. And I look forward to working with you as we are going forward to see the recommendations that you have made, how we can work together, uh, bringing all the other Christian professionals in the country so that we can help uh, the, for the sake of uh, the people, uh, the Mamambogas, the Boda Bodas, because we need to really help them. They look upon us to help them. Uh, without much ado, I would like to invite uh, uh, Naomi to close us with a word of prayer and uh, as she prefers to to join to to to, to pray uh, I would like to invite you uh, KCPF is a membership of organization uh, that uh, we have been in this space for more than 10 years uh, we were formed in 2010 uh, we have uh, we, we various membership categories. We have the paid up members, uh, where if you join us, you pay a 2,500, that is an annual subscription. 
And uh, we also have associate members where you just sign a code of conduct that you agreed uh, in line or you agree with what we do. And uh, also we have the student uh, membership. So for those who might be interested in joining us, uh, kindly you can visit our website. Uh, you'll get our contacts and our emails. Feel free to reach out to us and uh, we respond as soon as possible. If it's email or a call, uh, we'll be able to respond. Uh, I know uh, our chair, our board chair, uh, has not been able to join us uh, this evening. Uh, our chair is called Mr. Charles Kanjama, uh, but uh, he has wished you well and has appreciated you for being with us uh, this day. Uh, and I'm sure going forward, maybe the next webinar, you'll be with us and you'll also uh, be part of the contribution on what you'll be sharing. So Naomi, uh, are you ready? Okay, let's pray. God, we are grateful for the evening. Thank you for making this webinar be successful. Thank you for our speakers who have shared. Thank you, God, for the wisdom you entrusted unto them. And thank you for each and every member uh, who have uh, been in this webinar. Thank you, Jehovah God, how I pray for our country. I ask that God, you may help us to uh, to 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 come over or just to to see on how we are going to to give us wisdom on how we are going to elect our leaders and give them wisdom on how they are going to go about with our economy oh god because i know in everything you do you do according to your will i'm asking for your will towards our economy because uh this as the state is now god there are people who can't afford something and they are doing without it at a time they are struggling and things are not okay. We are asking that you may intervene. We are asking that you may take your central position. We are asking even in the coming election that you may help us to do what is according to our will. We surrender all to you. And we, um, we ask that um, you may just uh, do your will and do, you may uh, work according to our to your word and you may continue to encourage us as citizens or, and give us some more ways on how to handle this situation. Thank you, King of Kings, uh, because you're gracious and because you're wonderful. In Jesus' name I pray and believe, amen. Amen, amen. Uh, thank you, uh, Naomi. And uh, as we end our meeting, uh, I would like just to remind you that as we go out there, let's be ambassadors of Christ. Let's uh, talk to the people around us in our areas of influence. Let's encourage them that come August uh, 2022, they make a nice decision, the right decision for this country, because it's about leadership. The leadership that we have uh, is what is uh, affecting us. Uh, with that, I would like to uh, request all of you, you can leave at uh, your own pleasure.